Communist China is taking a massive toll on the environment, on land, in air, and underwater. The Asian nation is helping chop down trees, coming in among the world's top sponsors of deforestation. It's also overfishing our oceans, accounting for nearly half of all of the world's fishing activity. And last but far from least, it's polluting our air. In 2019, Beijing emitted more greenhouse gases than the entire developed world combined. In this special report, we take a look at the magnitude in which China is harming planet Earth and what can be done to stop it. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Scientists say our planet is enduring a lot right now. Data shows that forests are being cleared, ocean fish populations are taking damage, and our air is getting polluted. But which countries are the most responsible? Research reveals China sits near the top of that list. In this week's special report, we look at how the nation is contributing to these issues and what can be done to slow them down. Let's start off with deforestation. Forests cover nearly a third of the planet. That's about 15 million square miles. As of 2021, there are an estimated 3 trillion trees growing on Earth, or around 400 trees per person. Trillions of trees may seem like a lot, but we're actually losing them at an alarming rate. Over the past 30 years, we've lost 1.6 million square miles of forest. Here's some perspective for that number. Picture the size of an American football field. Now imagine 16 of those football fields. That's close to how much area of forest we're losing every minute over the past 30 years. And guess what? Currently, China measures in as one of the world's top sponsors of deforestation. Between 2013 and 2020, Chinese banks financed over $22 billion to certain major companies. All of them either produce or trade products that can lead to deforestation. Here are a few of them, palm oil, soy, beef, paper, rubber, and timber. China is home to only about 5% of the world's total forest area, so it has to import those commodities from other countries. The rainforest of the Congo and Cameroon in Central Africa, the Amazon Basin in South America, the islands of Indonesia and others are all being deforested to send wood to China. China is by far the world's biggest consumer of tropical timber. It imports up to 45 million cubic meters of wood every year. And the country's massive timber imports are now raising alarms in the global forest industry. In a report, Yale University said China is now being considered a predator when it comes to the world's forests. Beijing faced criticism for its aggression in pursuing global timber supplies. But generally, Beijing appears relatively unconcerned. To watch today's full special report, click the link in the description down below. We are working with Epoch TV, and all Friday special reports are published there in full length. Now we turn to today's daily news. In a speech this week, the U.S. Army Secretary said America's military must ask itself hard questions and is now at a strategic crossroads. Secretary of the Army Christine Wormuth said the U.S. still faces an array of challenges from Russia, North Korea and others. But, quote, one pacing challenge stands out above all, China, and we must transform to meet that challenge. Wormuth asks the army to update their thinking about military conflict with China. It could come to more than just exchanging long-range missiles. She said if the U.S. fails to deter either China or Russia, quote, we could even face attacks here on the United States itself. Wormuth says in the past two decades, while the U.S. was busy dealing with terrorists, China and Russia went to school on the American way of war. They modernized their military and built advanced space, cyber and disinformation capabilities. She says that's why the U.S. Army needs to seriously consider how to face these challenges. China and Russia are back to testing their military tactics. They held a joint naval exercise in the Sea of Japan on Friday. The drill is seen as a sign of closer ties between Beijing and Moscow. I believe that the General Secretary Xi Jinping is my friend. According to official reports during the Friday drills, the two practiced operating together. Some maneuvers designed to destroy floating enemy mines with artillery fire. The war games are running from Wednesday to Sunday. The exercises feature Russian warships, including minesweepers and a submarine. And Beijing sent two Chinese destroyers, a submarine and two corvettes. 
The combined force also had plans to practice air defense drills. China and Russia started to hold joint naval drills in 2005 at a time of souring relations with the West. It's also part of their effort to increase mutual interests between the two. We achieve good results in the political and economic areas. But the ties are often regarded as being for convenience. That starts with a 30-year deal worth hundreds of billions of dollars to deliver Russian gas to China. In exchange, Beijing provides money and technology that Moscow cannot get from the West. Despite China's fast-growing defense industry, almost 80 percent of its arms imports still come from Russia. And the joint exercises could be crucial for China, which has not been at war since the 1980s, while Russian troops have been on multiple fronts. Instead of sending troops to take over Taiwan, Beijing may infiltrate the island through remotely controlling pro-China forces from within. Former U.S. State Secretary Condoleezza Rice says she is more worried about such subversion, which is more possible than a military invasion. At a panel discussion this week, Rice said Beijing could achieve its goal of conquering Taiwan through tactics akin to Russia's actions against eastern Ukraine. That is, by using paramilitary forces to penetrate the nation, social media to sow discord, or by cutting underwater cables to the island country. She mentioned a fistfight inside the Taiwanese parliament a few weeks ago, saying, quote, I wondered to myself, did that really happen between the people of Taiwan, or was that something that was provoked from the outside? Beijing's infiltration campaign against Taiwan has been in operation for years. Their tactics include investing heavily in Taiwanese mainstream media to shift their editorial stance to be more pro-Beijing, as well as funding pro-Beijing candidates in elections and enlisting an internet army to attack political and social figures with hardline stances against the Chinese regime. In 2020, Taiwan passed an anti-infiltration act to counter the communist regime's influence campaign. But some experts in Taiwan's opposition party accused the law of spreading white terror, suppressing political dissidents and harming free speech in Taiwan. A loophole in Beijing's air defense strategy. That's according to the head of Taiwan's China affairs body. In a business conference on Thursday, the agency's head, Qing Tai Sen, broke the news of a secret visit from the U.S. Air Force to China. He says two U.S. fighter jets had flown close enough to China that they could have launched missiles at the country's coastal airfields, but China was totally unaware of it. That's because Chinese aircraft were busy intruding in Taiwan's southwestern airspace. Earlier this month, a record 149 Chinese military jets crossed into Taiwan's air defense zone, just as Beijing commemorated the founding of its communist regime. Chiu says the move was to counter the Malabar exercises starting on Tuesday. Naval forces from the U.S., Britain, Japan, Australia and others held the joint drill in southeast Taiwan waters to counter China. Chiu says China's military presence near Taiwan has become a warlike situation. The United States has apparently overtaken China in holding the largest share of the world's Bitcoin mining. That's after Chinese authorities cracked down on cryptocurrency activities in the country. Bitcoin mining is the way to get new Bitcoin. It's similar to gold mining. The difference is gold panning uses tools, but Bitcoin mining uses computers to solve math problems. If a miner gets the right answer, he will be rewarded with Bitcoin. This process is very energy intensive because the math problems are so complex that only incredibly powerful computers working day and night can solve them. The suppression in China started in late May, devastating the industry and forcing miners to close shop or move overseas. It is commonly believed that before the suppression, about 70 percent of Bitcoin mining activity happened in China. But by July, mining activity in China fell to zero. Now, the United States accounts for the largest share of mining. By the end of August, it was responsible for around 35 percent. That's according to Britain's Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. Britain is planning to invest about $700 million to develop the infrastructure at ports in Africa. The U.K. is partnering with a Dubai-based group, which will invest about $100 million. The initial focus is on modernizing and expanding three ports in Egypt, Senegal and Somaliland. More investments in ports and logistics across Africa are planned. Western governments are competing with China, Russia and Middle Eastern powers for influence in the area. 
Their key concerns center around investment and security issues. It comes after U.S. President Joe Biden called for a Western-led alternative to Beijing's Belt and Road Initiative. British Foreign Secretary Liz Truss says the projects would provide reliable and honest investment in developing countries. Hong Kong and mainland authorities have seized a large quantity of smuggled Australian lobsters. These lobsters are worth about $540,000 and are believed to have been on their way to mainland China. China banned lobster imports from Australia after the Australian government pushed for an international investigation into the origins of the CCP virus or the coronavirus. And Beijing has since blocked trade on other Australian imports, such as wine, barley, cotton and coal. Hong Kong authorities said at a news conference Friday that they seized over 11,000 pounds of lobsters and arrested 13 people. We believe that smuggling syndicates might make use of improper means to smuggle Australian lobsters to mainland China to seek profit. The monthly imports of Australian lobster to Hong Kong have since more than doubled. Hong Kong officials say the smuggling was fueled by a shortage of the lobsters on the mainland. It is increasingly expensive for Chinese factory to make goods. And while energy shortages are one factor driving prices higher, onlookers worry about the knock-on effects on global inflation. Julian Satterthwaite reports. Weak demand has consumer price inflation cooling off in China. But prices for goods from the country's factories are rising at a record pace, and the combination leaves policymakers with a dilemma. Numbers out Thursday showed producer prices rose 10.7% on the year in September. That's the highest since records began in 1996. Factory prices are soaring thanks to a power crunch that is raising energy costs. A months-long rally in global commodity prices also fueled the rise, but makers are struggling to pass on their higher costs to shoppers. Consumer inflation actually slowed last month, dipping 2.7%. It was capped by weak demand for everything from clothing to household appliances. Food prices also fell. Now economists say the central bank faces a conundrum. Weak demand argues for further support for the economy, but soaring producer prices limit the scope for action. As a result, few expect any cut in interest rates. Some also see hints that consumer prices won't be immune to inflation for much longer. This week, China's biggest maker of soy sauce said it would soon raise prices by up to 7%. It says rising costs for raw materials, energy and transport make the move unavoidable. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching. And before you go, here's a glimpse into next Friday's special report. Chinese property developer Evergrande is collapsing, but its problems are just the tip of the iceberg. What lies under the water is the now shaky pillar of the Chinese economy, real estate. What ugly truth is the Evergrande drama revealing about China's so-called economic miracle? Does China have the tools in its arsenal to keep the growth going or prevent a crisis? And what does an at-risk economy mean for the ruling Chinese Communist Party? In this special report, we look at what Beijing still has left up its sleeve to convince the Chinese people to ignore widespread issues and human rights abuse to preserve the economy and examine exactly how far this teetering domino effect could go 